welcome you to the next chapter of Flamingo, The Rat Trap by Selma Lagerlof. Now, if you look at this picture, this picture tends to speak a lot. The rat trap. The rat is trapped. But do you, do you see the depiction? You have a dollar bill. You have the rat dressed in clothes. So basically, what she is trying to depict is Maya Jal. We'll watch it further. Now, about her, Selma Lagerlof was a Swedish writer whose stories have been translated into many languages. Let me tell you, she was the first female Nobel laureate. A universal theme runs through all of them, a belief that the essential goodness in a human being can be awakened through understanding and love. It's not necessary that you have to fight always to bring out the goodness in someone. It all happens through a lot of understanding. Through love, when you explain things, things do happen. This story is set amidst the mines of Sweden, rich in iron ore, which figure large in the history and legends of that country. The story is told somewhat in the manner of a fairy tale. Very beautifully she has put it up. Very beautiful. You're really going to find this very interesting. So keep listening and keep watching. Once upon a time, there was a man who went around selling small rat traps of wire. We are all aware what are rat traps. You know, you have the small cage like thing where you, you know, trap the rats, where you put some uh, temptation for them. He made them himself at odd moments. At odd moments, yeah, before we go further, let me tell you the words that have been highlighted in red are the words which you should be knowing. And at the end of the presentation, you will find a slide with all these words and their meanings. So you can have them at one go. In one glance, you can have all the meanings in front of you. And let me also tell you, <coughs> this is very much required. Uh, let's raise the level of our vocabulary. I can always do this again in Hindi. You know, I can explain the whole story. But you will never be able to grasp these words. You will never be able to frame your answers in English. When you are framing your answers, you know, when you are asked a four marks, five marks question, you need to answer at that length. You cannot just give a very simple two, three line uh, answer and you lose your marks. So you need to understand the story and as I go line by line, but I would prefer doing it more in English here and there. Yes, you will get your Hindi words, but uh, preferably go for English because when you listen, you write accordingly. So it's definitely a better way out. So uh, coming back to the story, he made uh, them himself at odd moments. Odd moments means uh, short periods of free time. Like you have these odd moments throughout the day. You know, we are free that time. It's leisure. It's These are the odd moments. So, you know, please try using these words in your uh, communication as when you communicate, please use them as well. From the material he got by begging the stores or at big farms, he used to, uh, you know, beg at the stores and whatever they would give him. Accordingly, he would make these uh, cages. But even so, the business was not especially profitable. Now, obviously, how profitable or how lucrative, another word for profitable, lucrative. Uh, how lucrative could this be? I mean, it is such a tiny thing. So, now you have to, you know, uh, survive. So, how do you go ahead? So, he had to resort to both begging and petty thievery to keep body and soul together. Now, he because he did not get enough money from this business, you know, of selling these rat traps. So he started begging and also he got on to petty thievery. Petty thievery as in, you know, small, small robberies, you know, a wallet from their money from their small, small robberies. He would do that. Pay attention to keep body and soul together. Let's keep it connected body and soul. So if your soul is not there, you're dead, right? That's the dead body. So to keep them both going, to survive. So basically to keep body and soul together means to survive. Even so, his clothes were in rags. They were tattered. They were torn. 
his cheeks were sunken sunken means they were lowered they had no nutrition because he did not get enough to eat there was less of nutrition in his body and obviously it would it was showing on his face and hunger gleamed in his eyes and there was hunger he was extremely hungry and that hunger was shining bright in his eyes he was looking for food no one can imagine how sad and monotonous life can appear to such a vagabond who plods along the road left to his own meditations very beautifully put up you cannot imagine how sad and how monotonous monotonous i guess we are all aware it's very boring the same old routine time and time again daily if you have a same routine you are eventually going to get bored you some day you'll say that's enough let me break this i cannot go on this so you will break that monotony and you will come up try doing something different you know the, generally what happens weekdays what happens monday to friday like you consider the weekend saturday sunday so monday to friday we somehow most of us have that fixed routine yeah but saturday sunday we all want to break free we just want to do what we like not out of duty but yeah out of pleasure and so that was his life very boring and to such a vagabond vagabond as in he was a wanderer he had no fixed place to stay he kept roaming he kept going from one place to another so he did not have a fixed house who plods along the road plods as in he walks heavily i mean he had nothing much to do no fixed place to go no uh, work as such so he would just walk heavily yeah plod along the road left to his own meditations now meditation here does not mean the om meditation now here what it means is he was left to his thoughts his own thought process he would just keep thinking all the time so because he was walking slowly and you know he his mind kept running all the time obviously you know when you are looking for food when you are looking for money you keep thinking of ways that how should i make it how do i go about it but one day this man had fallen into a line of thought which really seemed to him entertaining now you know sometimes it's that eureka you know sometimes it's that thought oh yes this is good so he fell into a series of thought one thought connecting the other he started building it up but you know what he found it interesting he found it entertaining he said okay i think this is good i think i should go for it so something clicked him he had naturally been thinking of his rat traps when suddenly he was struck by the idea that the whole world about him the whole world with its lands and seas cities and villages was nothing but a big rat trap he was thinking about his rat traps he was you know uh, just thinking how to go about it when suddenly he connects he starts comparing what does he compare the whole world which is made up of you know cities villages lands and seas all of it the entire world was nothing but a big rat trap now imagine that world in the shape of a rat trap right and who are the rats you and me it's us we fall for those temptations so this like in hindi you call it again maya jal it ne had never existed for any other purpose than to set baits for people he says what was this world you see money you run after money you see fashion you run after fashion everything is just temptation baits means the temptation you know in the rat trap what we do hum wo chuhe dani mein cheese ya kuch chhod dete hain to wo chuha aata hai and you know he takes but he is blocked wo wahi pe qaid ho jata hai theek aise likewise we fall for such temptations when we run after money we keep doing it without giving it a second thought we go so uh, blindly after it that we miss on so many things in life so uh, that's where they say you should have a balanced life you should have a well balanced life so this is what he said the people are falling for those temptations this whole world all the people here like you talk talk of the rats 
right? Imagine that whole world as a rat trap. Imagine the people as rats and imagine all of them running for the bait. Yeah, that temptation of uh, fame, you call a fame, you call money, so many things where you want to be at your best. It offered riches and joys, shelter and food, heat and clothing, exactly as the rat trap offered cheese and pork. And as soon as anyone let himself be tempted to touch the bait, it closed on him and then everything came to an end. So this is what it is. Like we, I already told you, when they are, you want to run after riches and joys, you want to run after shelter and food, you want to run after heat and clothing, exactly in the same manner as the rat goes for the cheese, we go for such things. And what happens? Eventually, we are trapped. We are trapped in such a bad manner that we realize it. You will soon realize it in this lesson as well. The world had, of course, never been very kind to him. So it gave him unwanted joy to think ill of it in this way. The world had never been kind to him. It, he had not got those clothes, the proper clothes, the basic necessities, if you talk of food, shelter, he had not got the basic necessities as well. And that is the reason there was nothing to motivate him to think that, oh, life is beautiful. He did not get it. Life had given him nothing apart from pain and misery. So obviously, the definition of life from his pain, from his experience was totally different. He hated it. It became a cherished pastime of his during many dreary ploddings to think of people he knew who had let themselves be caught in the dangerous snare and of others who were still circling around the bait. Beautifully put. Watch it. Now, it became a cherished pastime. You know what he would do? While he was going for those dull walks, dreary ploddings, he used to walk, prodding is again, uh, plodding is again those, you know, uh, walking with heavy steps and dreary is dull. So since he had no aim, he was aimlessly walking. And that time when he was left to his meditations, remember we read earlier. So yeah, so when he would keep thinking that the thought process would go on, that is the time he would enjoy thinking of people he knew who had, who had let themselves be caught in a dangerous trap. Here, he's thinking, he's saying how that person had got tempted for the riches and the joys and he started moving towards it and then he fell into a trap. He fell into a dangerous trap. And of those who were still circling around the bait, some are still tempted. They are getting tempted that I should get that money. Oh, I want that I want to buy a 4BHK. I want to buy that bungalow. Oh, I want to go for that international trip. You know, they are circling around those temptations. I want that big car. I want the latest phone. All these are temptations. All these are baits. The temptations. The rat trap. You remember the world? This is it. One dark evening, as he was trudging along the road, as he was walking heavily down the road, he caught sight of a little grey cottage by the roadside. When he was walking, now because he was homeless, he was a wanderer, a vagabond. As he was walking, he came across a grey cottage. Grey means like a dull greyish type cottage. He came across that which was on the roadside. And he knocked on the, on the door to ask shelter for the night. He knocked and he wanted to spend some spend his night in under some shelter, under some roof. So this cottage, this small little house that they had, he knocked on the door to ask, said, may I spend the night here? Nor was he refused. He wasn't even refused. The owner of the house welcomed him wholeheartedly. Instead of the sour faces which ordinarily met him, the owner, who was an old man without wife or child, was happy to get someone to talk to in his loneliness. Generally, whenever he would ask for such favours, they would let him down. They would just turn a sour face. There's nothing doing. Sorry, please move on. Go further. Uh, at times, obviously, you don't want a stranger in your house at night. Someone whom you really don't know. 
actually risky, but yeah, that's how he used to experience. He met him, the owner, who was who had no family. He had no wife. He had no children. He was absolutely alone. He used to live alone in that house, and he was lonely. Get the difference: alone and lonely. Right? Alone was he was absent. There was nobody else in the house, and lonely because he had no one to talk to. He was very lonely there. So he was happy when someone came to his doorstep to ask. So he felt, oh, that's company for me because he had no one to talk to. So he felt, so he welcomed him wholeheartedly. Immediately, he put the porridge pot on the fire and gave him supper. Then he carved off such a big slice from his tobacco roll that it was enough both for the stranger's pipe and his own hospitality. Meman Navazi, Atithi Devo Bhava. That's what we call in India. That's what we welcome guests, right? So this is what he did. He immediately, you know, put up a porridge pot on the fire. Porridge is something they make, uh, like we can say, khichdi in our things. They they have different ingredients to make that porridge, but that's how they have uh, something for a light supper, like a light dinner generally. And he gave him supper, and he carved off he. Cut. He cut a big slice from his tobacco roll. He did that, and that was enough for his pipe, the stranger's pipe, and his own. He had enough of it to, you know, uh, smoke for himself uh, as as well as the stranger. Finally, he got out an old pack of cards and played miolis or majolis. You can say it both the ways. This is a game which they uh, which they play using the playing cards. Right, so with his guest until bedtime. So beautiful. He had someone. See, he was alone at home. He had nobody to talk to. He had nobody to play with. So when this, uh, when the stranger walked in, so he was he was more than happy because he had someone to eat with. He he even cooked for him. He wanted to. He played cards with him. He even smoked his cigar with him. So he was finding it very good. The old man was just as generous with his confidences as with his porridge and tobacco. Now, just like he was very generous, he was like them uh, happy types, and you know, readily giving him. So the way he, you know, cooked food for him, the way he gave him tobacco, very generously. He also was generous with his confidences, confidences, secrets. So. He started sharing his secrets. You know, there's. It's very uh, uh, like when you're lonely, when you have no one to talk to, no one to share things with. Suddenly, when someone comes, no, you pour your heart out. There are so many secrets you keep within. You don't know whom to share it with. But because he got someone to talk to, he started pouring out everything that was in his heart. He just started sharing all his secrets with him. It really didn't mean anything. He was a stranger. Why, why, why should he do it, or why would he do it? But yeah, he felt good about it. He just felt he had company, so he started sharing anything and everything. The guest was informed at once that in his days of prosperity, his host had been a crofter at Ramsjo Ironworks and had worked on the land. Now the guest. Uh, the vagabond who is there, the rat trap, the peddler, uh, who has taken shelter in his house. Now he was telling him, he was sharing with him that you know when I was in those days of prosperity, when I had a lot of money, prosperity is riches. So those days uh, when I was really uh, nice and rich, I was a crofter at Ramsjo Iron Works. Crofter as in you work on a rented land. Yeah, you're working for someone. So he was a crofter there. And he had worked on the land. Now that he was no longer able to do day labor, he was no longer in that condition to work. It was his cow which supported him. He had kept a cow. He was taking care of a cow. Now that was the source of income. Obviously, he needed money. Now he couldn't work. So what he did was he kept a cow in his house. Yes, that bossy was extraordinary. Bossy, it means cow. All right, so that's another word for cow. <clears throat> Initially, they used to use this word. 
now it has changed so that bossy was extraordinary it was not an ordinary cow there was something unique something different in that cow from the rest of the cows she could give milk for the creamery every day and last month he had received all of 30 kroner in payment now what was it how was she unique she would give milk for the creamery creamery is uh, a place where they sell dairy products. We all know what are dairy products, milk, butter, cheese, cream, all those things. So she would give enough milk to give it to the creamery every day. And last month, because he had provided so much of milk, he had sold so much of milk, he got 30 kroner. Kroner is the currency used in Sweden. Yeah. So he had got 30 of it in payment. The stranger must have seemed incredulous for the old man got up and went to the window took down a leather pouch which hung on a nail in the very window frame and picked out three wrinkled 10 kroner bills now the stranger a rat trap seller he was incredulous. He seemed incredulous. Incredulous, it was difficult for him to believe. He says, how can he get so much? You know, he had that look on the face. You can quite often, you know, read someone's face. So uh, the host, he could read his face that he's not ready to believe me that I've got so much of payment. So what he did to prove himself, to prove what he said was right, what he did, he got up and went to the window he took down a leather pouch. There was a leather pouch, a bag made of leather, which hung on a nail in the very window frame. On the window frame, there was a nail and to that hook was at, put the leather pouch. And he picked out from that pouch, he picked out three wrinkled, you know, they were crumpled. The notes were not straight. They were crumpled notes. Three wrinkled 10 kroner bills. These he held up before the eyes of his guest. He showed those three notes in front of his guest. He put it in front of his eyes, nodding knowingly and then stuffed them back into the pouch. He said, see, when I told you 30, I see here they are. You know, that's how he showed it to him. And then he put them back into that leather pouch. The next day, both men got up in good season. The next, now they fell asleep finally. It was night, right? They had smoked, they had talked, they had played cards. Everything done and they went to sleep. Morning when they woke up, the season was nice. It was nice and a chilly morning. The crofter was in a hurry to milk his cow. Remember, that was his source of income. So he, as soon as you wake up, you know, you want to get back to work. So that's what he did. He got up early and to milk his cow. And the other man probably thought he should not stay in bed when the head of the house had gotten up. Now, out of courtesy, out of, uh, you know, ethics, he felt that now the owner of the house has got up. I don't think I should be sleeping. So as a guest, he felt that and he immediately got up too. They left the cottage at the same time. Both of them left the cottage at the same time. Even the rat trap seller left and so did the host. The crofter locked the door and put the key in his pocket. Now, they both came out of the cottage. He locked it and he put the key in his pocket. The man with the rat traps said goodbye and thank you and thereupon each went his own way. Now they both went their own way. They all said goodbye, they greeted, he expressed his gratitude, he said thank you and he moved on. But half an hour later, the rat trap peddler stood again before the door. Now comes the twist. Now the rat trap seller left. So did the host, the crofter also left. But what happened is half an hour later, now the crofter was not there, he had gone to milk the cow. So what did the rat trap peddler do? Achha, peddler, who is a peddler? A peddler is a hawker. Like you know, you have these, uh, 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 they go from door to door, they you know, go on the road, you call them hawkers. So there is a difference between a hawker and a vendor. Now, when you go to a theater, what do you see? You see a popcorn vendor, you see an ice cream vendor. They are fixed at their places. That's a vendor. But a hawker is the one who moves from door to door. He keeps moving. Those are hawkers. 
Like even uh, on the station, on the platform, you find hawkers. Vendors are also there. You have the newspaper stand, you know, you have all the groceries and stuff. So that is the time, uh, that is the difference between hawker and vendor. Now, after half an hour, he came back. He came back to the same house standing in front of the door of the crofter. He did not try to get in. However, he only went up to the window, smashed a pane, stuck in his hand and got hold of the pouch with the 30 kroner. He took the money and thrust it into his own pocket. Now, if you remember, where was that leather pouch? It was just near the window frame, on a nail near the window frame. What he did was, he did not open the door. He did not have the keys. Maybe he could have broke, uh, you know, broken the door and got in. But he didn't do that. You know what he did? He smashed the window pane. The window pane made of glass, he broke that. He broke that, he put his hand in and he quickly took the pouch because it was very close to the window. He had kept that in the mind. Now, come on, he was used to that petty thievery, you remember? He doing the small robberies, the small uh, odd jobs. So, he took that, I mean, they have their own ideas. So, he broke the window pane, the glass of the window. He put his hand in, he took the leather pouch out. He took out the 30 kroner and he put that money into his pocket. Then he hung the leather pouch very carefully back in its place and went away. At least he did not take the leather pouch. He only took that money. He wanted that and he put the pouch back on the nail. As he walked along with the money in his pocket, he felt quite pleased with his smartness. He says, oh, I made it once again. So he was very, you know, he felt, okay, I'm smart, you know, I did it. I, he was really proud about his smartness. He realized, of course, that at first he dared not continue on the public highway, but must turn off the road into the woods. Now, the next thing that struck him, you know, when you are doing something wrong, you, you know, tend to be on the alert mode. And so what he felt was, he said, look, uh, now I have stolen the money. Now, if the, he was on a highway, if you remember, where he came across this grey cottage. So, if he walks on the highway, very obvious that the crofter can easily catch him because he will follow him. He will definitely catch him on the highway. So, he says, I don't think that is a smart move. That's not a wise thing to do right now. What I should do is, I should get into the woods. Into the woods meaning into the jungle. I should get away inside in a jungle, obviously once you enter, you definitely cannot come out until and unless you are aware of each and every step of it. During the first hours, this caused him no difficulty. Initially, now remember it is morning time, okay. He has got into the woods. There was no difficulty, he could see the roads, he could, uh, sorry, the, the path, the trees, the bushes, everything was very clear in front of him. So there were no difficulties, no issues. Later in the day, it became worse. For it was a big and confusing forest which he had gotten into. Now, obviously, a forest, you just don't know where you are going. How many times have you gone around the same place? Or are you going towards the wrong side? You have no indication. There are no indications there. All trees look the same, all bushes. You don't know whether you have crossed that road or not. So he now realized that he is into big trouble. He tried to be sure to walk in a definite direction. But the paths twisted back and forth so strangely. He thought, okay, I'll keep this, you know, as a landmark maybe. You know, this, I have crossed this tree. But every tree looks like one another. They all look so same. And he tried thinking that, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that I walk only this way and I don't come back. But uh, to his dismay, the paths twisted back and forth very strangely. He kept moving around the same places again and again. He walked and walked without coming to the end of the wood. He had no end. There was no end to it, obviously. And finally, he realized that he had only been walking around in the same part of the forest. Initially, he had all the energy. He was fresh. 
but gradually as it started you know as his time start passing by he realized that he was going round and round in the same path he had not crossed to any corner where he could come out of the forest all at once he recalled his thoughts about the world and the rat trap can you tell me now who is the rat and what is the trap here it was he now who is the rat he got tempted that money that 30 kroner became the bait the temptation he fell for it and he got trapped now he is in a forest he is totally trapped and he doesn't know he can't find his way out so this when he was just giving it a thought of the people who had got stuck today it was his turn he had fallen into the same trap now his own turn had come he had let himself be fooled by a bait and had been caught the whole forest with its trunks and branches its thickets and fallen logs closed in upon him like an impenetrable prison from which he could never escape now he had fallen into that trap he was surrounded he was totally surrounded by the trunks the tree trunks we all know what are the trunks thickets are those thick bushes like uh, a forest is all full of them fallen logs logs of wood closed in upon him like an impenetrable prison a prison which he could never escape he was in such a prison where there was no way out he couldn't find a way out of it it was late in december now it was you know peak winters december we all know they are peak winters darkness was already descending over the forest so beautiful it is so nicely said darkness was already descending over the forest in simple words it was becoming night night was coming in so it's so beautifully put see that's the way that's a smart way you know of juggling with words this is something we should learn and we should even use so darkness was already descending over the forest this increased the danger what kind of danger he was in a forest what can you expect wild animals of course this increased the danger and increased also his gloom and despair now as the night as the sun started setting the night started setting in what was happening now his sadness increased he was getting sad because why his despair he became hopeless he was losing hope he says now what in the whole day if i could not find a way out of this forest what do i do at night he it seemed to be a hopeless case finally he saw no way out and he sank down on the ground tired to death thinking that his last moment had come he became hopeless he literally gave up he fell to the ground he now thought that the next i know it's time to die there is no way i'm sure either i will be killed by this winter the cold chilly night or some wild animal will attack me and obviously how will he save himself so he fell on the ground he heard a sound a hard regular thumping suddenly when he fell to the ground he heard some sound you know he was trying to uh, find a way to survive to save himself from there and so he suddenly heard this thumping thumping is you know someone beating very badly like some loud sound hitting a metal that is thumping there was no doubt as to what that was he was very smart he understood that that thumping he is familiar he knows what it is he raised himself he immediately got up those are the hammer strokes from an iron mill he recognized those big sounds he says when you hammer the iron so iron mill is basically a place where all the iron products are made right things are made out of iron 
he thought there must be people nearby obviously if someone is doing that thumping there must be a person around there must be a place around so he immediately got up he summoned all his strength he put up he gathered all his strength remember he had grown weak whole day he was moving in the forest he had grown weak but he summoned all his strength got up and staggered in the direction of the sound he got up and he literally pushed himself he had no strength he staggered in the direction that means he literally pushed himself from where the sound was coming he started walking in that direction with very weak steps well just like i told you this is the end of part 1 of our story and all the words that you had found which were highlighted in red have been given here and the meanings have been provided to you you definitely can go through to get a better understanding but to what i understand uh, the way you have got the explanation i'm sure the story is crystal clear till here right and so let's wait once you take a good break you can start the next part of the story here we begin the second part of the rat trap but before we move on let's briefly recap part 1 you remember the peddler the rat trap seller he used to sell those rat traps as well as he had he used to do a lot of thievery petty thievery small small uh, you know robberies and where he was wandering one fine day and he goes to one grey cottage and there that man really welcomes him with open arms he feeds him they play cards and if you remember the 30 kroner that he had stolen you know from his a uh, window uh, from the pouch and he moves from there towards the highway but then he realizes that i shouldn't be taking the highway i should get into the jungle and uh, so that he does not catch up on me highway was a very easy catch so he moves on into the jungle and he starts uh, losing his way he does not he's uh, unable to move out of the jungle and then as he was about to give up it was night time you know the night had set in and then he did not know what to do because he had he was out of energy he was uh, he didn't know how to get out of that place and he literally gave up because it was extremely cold and he was just about to faint when he hears a sound you remember that now what was that sound here it is in part 2 the ramsco iron works which are now closed down were not so long ago a large plant with smelter rolling mill and forge now the sound the thumping sound he knew he knew it was the metal which is being beaten he got that and he started walking towards that sound and when he started walking he landed up at the ramsco iron works now what was this it was well it is now closed down currently like now when the uh, author has already written the story it is closed down but then at that point of time it was operating it was working but it was not so long ago a large plant with smelter smelter is one unit of that plant where you know they put in the ore and then they remove the metal out of it they put the raw thing and they remove the metal the iron out of it the rolling mill that iron which comes out from the smelter is put into the rolling mill which rolls that into sheets it melts it and it rolls it into long sheets and forge you have the forge where they shape up that rolling you where you have rolled that uh, iron into the sheets those sheets are made into the particular pieces that you require the desired shapes now in summer time long lines of heavily loaded barges and scows slid down the canal which led to a large inland lake and in the winter time the roads near the mill were black from all the coal dust which sifted down from the big charcoal crates now what is the poet uh, the author trying to tell us is the summer time long lines of heavily loaded barges and scows barges and scows are those typical ships they are those typical type of big boats which carry the material which carry loads they carry products 
from one place to another right and these they go down the canal they have this canal out there which led to a large inland lake now this canal would lead into the lake and then they would get into the uh, go further and export the goods and in the winter time the roads near the mill were black why were they black because of all the coal dust which sifted sifted as in to sieve you know when you sieve a uh, floor you uh, you get the floor down and you get the remains on top that's the sieve so this is sift he sifted the big charcoal crates now here they used to carry the charcoal in that but out of that which powder uh, which fell from there which sifted from there it made all the roads black right from all it was black from all the coal dust the dust which was going in these crates during one of the long dark evenings just before christmas the master smith and his helper sat in the dark forge near the furnace waiting for the pig iron which had been put in the fire to be ready to put on the anvil now this was one of those long dark evenings the day uh, our uh, peddler or the rat trap seller he lands up you know from the forest and he goes out there that was one of the long dark evenings just before christmas so basically it was the christmas eve the evening before christmas that's the 24th december evening we call that the christmas eve so the master smith the main owner the smith of the the master over there and his helper they sat in the dark forge they sat in the dark forge that forge is that place where uh, like i told you they shape up uh, the metal the iron into different things into different shapes near the furnace waiting for the pig iron pig iron again they are small pieces of met of iron which are shaped up and then those are melted and then they are put on the anvil anvil is one slide um, uh, it's a slight board sort of thing where they heat it up and they shape it up those are the pig iron every now these guys were sitting over there right they were waiting over there every now and then one of them got up to stir the glowing mass with a long iron bar returning in a few minutes dripping with perspiration now every now and then now they both were sitting the main leader the main head or uh, the smith and they both were sitting outside there now every now and then what did they do they got up uh, to go and see that to stir the glowing mass now that in the forge you know you had that a uh, big uh, fire thing and they used to take a long iron bar you know with a long iron bar they had to go and stir the pig iron those pieces of iron over there with a long thing now you can imagine the heat in that because they were right next to the furnace right and whenever they did that they returned in a few minutes after stirring that after doing that with a long iron bar they would come back dripping with perspiration as in sweating sweating badly sweating profusely though as was the custom he wore nothing but a long shirt and a pair of wooden shoes all that these people had worn was a very long shirt and they had worn wooden shoes you can imagine because of the heat out there though they are supposed as was the custom that's how they were supposed to do uh, because they were working in such a place they had to make sure that they are dressed accordingly all the time there were many sounds to be heard in the forge now there were different kinds of sounds now it, you know the metal it was being heated and melted so there were different kinds of sounds coming what were they the big bellows groaned you have this bellow you have this you know thing where uh, they pump it from one side and the other side you have an opening where the air comes out right it pumps up the air so that the heat the fire becomes more right to increase the flame so those big bellows you where you, where you would uh, release uh, the air 
and the burning coal cracked. Now the, the coal which was burning obviously with the cracking sound also kept coming. The fire boy shoveled charcoal into the maw of the furnace with a great deal of clatter. The fire boy, the helper, there must be a helper out there who must be doing, who must be there specially to do this. So he shoveled charcoal. You have a shovel. We all know what a shovel is, right? So he would shovel the charcoal. He would take the charcoal in that shovel and he would put it into the open. There's an opening surface. It's a big mouth, you know, the maw of the furnace. That's the open mouth, the big mouth of the furnace with a great deal of clatter. That big noise would come whenever he would put that. Outside roared the waterfall and a sharp north wind whipped the rain against the brick tiled roof. Now what happened? Inside all these sounds were going on, right? And outside it they showed the waterfall. Now there was a waterfall nearby. So you know when it's pretty noisy, that sound of the water, you know the waterfall is pretty noisy. So that was there and a sharp north wind whipped the rain against the brick tiled roof. This also tells you that it was raining pretty heavily and the north wind was hitting, it was making the rain hit the roof with a sound. So now all these together were the sounds that were happening when the peddler, when our rat trap seller was just there. It was probably on account of all this noise that the blacksmith did not notice that a man had opened the gate and entered the forge until he stood close up to the furnace. Now you see, because all these noises were going on, there was, there was so much noise all around that these people here did not realize that somebody had opened the gate. He had opened the gate and he had entered the forge until he came very close to the furnace. He no, Till then nobody was aware that he had come. It was because of that the blacksmith did not realize. Surely it was nothing unusual for poor vagabonds without any better shelter for the night to be attracted to the forge by the glow of light which escaped through the sooty panes. Now, uh, vagabonds we know are wanderers, right? Now, for them, in that jungle area, you know, very close to this was the, uh, they, he came across this uh, iron thing. Surely, it was nothing unusual for the poor vagabonds. They, it was nothing new. It was nothing different. Everyone, uh, every wanderer would somehow land up there. How they would do that? Because they would be attracted to the forge. Why? Because of the glow of light which escaped through the sooty panes. Now, panes here are the window panes. And sooty means it was dark uh, because it, it, the iron thing was there, the dust was flying. So, obviously, those windows were nearly dark. But yes, obviously, the light could go through it. So, looking at the light, all the wanderers in the night, where would they go? Uh, afraid of the jungle and, you know, the rain and the winter, the cold night. So, they would all generally, quite commonly, come and take shelter here. And to come into the, uh, and come in to warm themselves in front of the fire. Like I said, it, it was already very cold. And so, they would come inside to take some warmth uh, of the fire. The blacksmiths glanced only casually and indifferently at the intruder. He just gave a very slight glance. He did not really bother, you know, very casually and indifferently. He says like, okay, fine, he's come. He At the intruder, he just, remember, he had just come in without any permission. So, he becomes an intruder. He looked the way people of his type usually did. Here, the rat trap seller. How did he look? With a long beard, dirty, ragged and with a bunch of rat traps dangling on his chest. Now, he was already in rags. He was in torn clothes. So, he was very dirty. That's how he looked when he landed up there. He asked permission to stay and the master blacksmith, the main leader, the main person there, nodded a haughty consent without honoring him with a single word. 
Now the master blacksmith just is okay, fine, you know, just out of this was a haughty concern. He said, okay, fine, out of disrespect. And he didn't even utter a word though. He just, you know, he just did that. So he without saying a single word and, you know, out of disrespect, he told him, okay, go sit there. The tramp did not say anything either. Now, who is the tramp? The tramp, the wanderer, the vagabond, the rat trap seller, the peddler. All these are the names, are the different names which have been given to the rat trap seller. Right? So, they, uh, he has, has been referred to with different names. So, don't get confused if a question comes based with uh, different names. So, the tram did not say anything either. Even he did not utter a word. He had not come there to talk but only to warm himself and sleep. You remember, he had passed through that jungle all day long. Right from early morning, he was wandering in that jungle and he was all exhausted. So, all that he was looking for was some warmth and a good sleep to freshen up. In those days, the Ramsco Iron Mill was owned by a very prominent iron master whose greatest ambition was to ship out good iron to the market. Now, the iron, uh, sorry, the Ramsco Iron Mill, it was owned by a very prominent, a very uh, famous type of iron master. He was extremely famous, very well-known iron master. Why? Because his ambition was very good. He, he wanted the best iron. He wanted the very, uh, you know, good iron to go to the market. He watched both night and day to see that the work was done as well as possible. See, he was very responsible. He was ambitious because he wanted to make sure that the best iron goes to the market. So, what he would do, he would come in there to check day and night. Both the times he would come once to have a look to make sure that everything is working well. And at this very moment, he came into the forge on one of his night, uh, nightly rounds of inspection. Now, at that point of time, when the rat trap seller had entered and, you know, uh, the master blacksmith had let him sit near the fire, at the same point of time, uh, the prominent the very well-known iron master comes for his inspection, for his round, which was in the night. He came into the forge. Naturally, the first thing he saw was the tall ragamuffin who had eased his way so close to the furnace that steam rose from his wet rags. As soon as he entered, the first thing he came across was the tall ragamuffin. Another name for the rat trap seller. Ragamuffin, a person who is, you know, uh, dressed in torn clothes, rags, torn clothes. So, another name for him. Uh, he had been so close. Now, remember, he was all wet. It was raining outside and it was extremely cold. So, what he had done, he was very close to the furnace. He went extremely close to the furnace so that he can get a lot of heat, a lot of warmth. And he was so close that literally out of his torn clothes, there was steam coming out. You know, he was that close to the furnace. The iron master did not follow the example of the blacksmiths. What do you mean? The iron master, he did not do what the master blacksmith had done. He, uh, you know how he had out of disre disrespect uh, referred to him, but he did not do that. What did he do? Uh, the example of the blacksmith who had hardly deigned to look at the stranger. He had not even bothered because he felt it was out of his dignity. Okay, fine, these people keep coming and going. So, okay, fine, go for it. Just come and sit there. So, he did not do that. The iron master did not do what he, what the blacksmith had done. He walked close up to him, looked him over very carefully, then tore off his slouch hat to get a better view of his face. What did he do? He walked close to him, right? He looked him over very carefully. He looked at him nicely to observe who is this person. And then tore off as in he moved away his slouch hat. Slouch hat is that hat, you know, which, which is bent at one side of the head. So, he moved it away. 
to get a better view of his face to make sure who is that person he wanted to identify. But of course, it is you, Nils Olof, he said. How you do look? Nils Olof? Was that the rat trap seller's name? No, it wasn't. He thinks it is him. The man with the rat traps had never before seen the Iron Master at Ramsco and did not even know what his name was. Now, the Iron Master calls him by the name Nils Olof. But our rat trap seller had never even seen this man before. He had never even known what his name was. But it occurred to him that if the fine gentleman thought he was an old acquaintance, he might perhaps throw him a couple of krona. Now, at that point of time, the rat trap seller, how his wicked mind works, what did he do is, he says he thinks I am Nils Olof. It's fine. Let him do that. Maybe he thinks I'm his old friend, his old acquaintance, his old friend. Someone whom you know. He might perhaps throw him a couple of kroner. He says, who knows, out of, you know, that love and sympathy, he might give me some money as well. So let him take it that way that I am that person, though I am not. Therefore, he did not want to undeceive him all at once. He wanted to make him believe that, okay, according to you, if I am Nils Olof, I am. He did not bother to tell him that, look, that's not me. That's not what you are looking at. I am not him. But he did not do that. He did not want to undeceive. He did not want to break his belief. Yes, God knows things have gone downhill with me, he said. And when remember he had asked him, how do you look? And he says, yes, God knows things have been extremely bad. Downhill means worse. They have been extremely bad with me, he said. You should not have resigned from the regiment, said the Iron Master. He says you should not have, you know, resigned from that army unit. You should have stayed there. You should have continued to work there. That was the mistake. If only I had still been in the service at the time, it would never have happened. Well, now, of course, you will come home with me. He says, maybe if you would have continued working out there, things would have been fine. You would have remained in the regiment. Things would have been better. This wouldn't have been your case. But anyways, now, of course, you will come home with me. He says, now, don't worry. Now that I have met you, I have seen you, you come home with me. To go along up to the manor house and be received by the owner like an old regimental comrade, that, however, did not please the tramp. Now, this is where the manor house, uh, the iron master lived. Now, they went up to the, uh, to the manor house and they were received by the owner. Uh, he was received by the owner like an old regimental comrade, like an old friend who worked together in the army. That, however, did not please the tramp. Somehow, somewhere, he was not happy with it. Why? No, I couldn't think of it, he said, looking quite alarmed. He thought of the 30 Croner. Now, he realizes something, you know, uh, tingles in his mind that now I was happy, you know, thinking of the people who fall in the rat trap of the world. You remember, he spoke about the world being a rat trap and how people fall, uh, you know, as a, ba a bait of, uh, you know, where they want money, where they want riches. They run after that and they fall into trouble. Some way he realizes at this point of time that boss, I am in for that big trouble. Somewhere I have had that, I mean, I have also fallen trap into that. To go up to the manor house would be like throwing himself voluntarily into the lion's den. That guilt of stealing that money was in his head. 
he says if i go here now if i go inside and if things happen you know maybe the police comes maybe anything and he asks me anything i am like you know getting into trouble into the lions den into big trouble he only wanted a chance to sleep here in the forge and then sneak away as in inconspicuously as possible what did he want to do all that he wanted was to sleep in the forge right that big metal thing where they had where there was furnace he just wanted to have a good sleep with that with that warmth and then he would sneak away he would quietly go away hidingly inconspicuously is that invisibly unnoticeably he would have just moved away from there nobody would have even realized he's gone the iron master assumed that he felt embarrassed because of his miserable clothing now the iron master felt that you know maybe he's he's hesitant he's unwilling to enter because he's not even dressed properly miserable extremely badly he was in torn clothes so he felt the iron master felt that maybe he's feeling bad about the fact that he's not well dressed he's feeling embarrassed about it